This episode is brought to you by Sutra Beauty. Hi, Flor. How are you? Welcome to my podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me. We're all great. Thank God. Yes. Um, I want to tell my uh, listeners about you. So your name is Flor Hassan Nahum, and you are an Israeli politician and a policymaker. You are currently serving as a deputy mayor of Jerusalem and in charge of foreign relations, international economic developments, and tourism. And you are also the co-founder and founding member of the UAE Israel um, Business Council. So now that they know who you are, um, I want to ask you first, how, how, well, tell us, you know, a little bit about yourself, like your background and how did you end up uh, being a politician? That's a great question. I think a lot of normal people get asked that question more in politics. Um, so basically, I come from Gibraltar, which is a British protectorate in southern Spain. Mm -hmm. um, so we grew up with Spanish culture, but we've got British passports and we mm -hmm. learn in English. And my mother's originally from Morocco. Mm -hmm. So we are Sephardi Jews, Spanish Moroccan Sephardi Jews. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in Gibraltar. My father was actually a politician in Gibraltar. Um, and I guess that's part of it. It's not that you grow up. I mean, my parents put zero pressure on, on me mm -hmm. to, you know, follow in my father's footsteps or anything like that. But I think that people do what they know. And that was the life that I was exposed to. Yeah. I uh, immigrated to Israel. I studied in the UK. I'm a lawyer by profession. I came to Israel with my husband. We were newly married um, 22 years ago, actually. And I worked for many, many years in nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Nothing to do with politics. Always, oh, okay. you know, right, always so want to heal mm -hmm. the world. So I went into nonprofit for a long time. Okay, I didn't realize that. I you I thought you know you started with politics, but so you started no. with, with nonprofit and like activism, kind of. Exactly. So I started with nonprofit activism. I always felt that I was giving a voice to the voiceless. Um, worked in different types of nonprofit organizations. The last one that I worked for was actually um, an organization in Ukraine for Jewish abandoned and abused Jewish children. Unfortunately, today, because of the Ukrainian war, they've had to move from Ukraine to yeah. Romania. But I was there for five years, and then I set up my own company. And I used to help people with storytelling. So I used to do messaging for them, help them with public speaking, do, uh, you know, create pitches for startups. So yeah. I had a very successful business. And one day, I get a call from a friend who's involved in a small political party here in the city of Jerusalem. And she said to me, you know, I think they really need help with their messaging. And because you do this for clients, I think you could really help them. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, okay, this is interesting getting into political communications. Mm -hmm. I was already doing communications in the private sector, nonprofits. So I said, okay. And I did one or two sessions with them. And I really, up until that moment, hadn't understood what local politics is about. In America, you have many layers. You've got yes. regional government and local government, and state government and federal government. In Israel, you've only got two layers, local yes. and national, that's it. And so people are very focused in this country with national government. But in fact, I discovered that what actually helps people day to day is local government. And so after the second session of helping them, they said to me, would you be interested in running with us for city council? And at that point, I wasn't sure. You know, I've got four kids. I had this business. I'm like, how am I going to fit it all in? Mm -hmm. And then I just one of those people that I feel that if God opens a door, you should mm -hmm. really walk through it. Not every day you get an offer to serve your city, serve your country. So I thought, OK, I'm going to go for it. <laughs> so that's been seven years now that I'm a city council member. And in the last four years, deputy mayor. Wow, that's amazing, really. And you know what? Like, it's kind of interesting because I feel like my life is kind of turned into that direction too. You know, like I started with nonprofit, just doing, you know, like um activism and you know non government work. And now I feel like I'm headed like literally. I'm I decided to run for Congress, and I'm. I saw. I'm so you know? proud of you. Thank you have you. to do it. You have to do no, it. Yeah, it's just, you know, give. like it's kind of like you do a lot with your work as an activist, but then you are not as satisfied anymore. Like this is what well, I, 
I like, don't I think like I could that. do more. I think is that you're smart enough to realize that you can do a lot of work as an activist and activists really are the backbone, especially here in this country. Mm -hmm. Civil society is very strong, but the impact you can have in political office is huge. Exactly. So it's yeah. about influence. Mm -hmm. And That's I think you true. realize that and you want to go to the yeah. next stage of your activism. Yeah. You know, yeah, I, I just felt like I... I spend a lot of my time like criticizing like, you know, politicians and their work. And I'm like, you know what? I could actually do that job. Like, why do I have to keep just raising awareness about what's going on when I could be the one with an influence to make something, you know, happen? So, yeah, I, I think, I think yeah, I, yeah, I spent like what, like six years now in the activism world. And I feel like, you know, thank God, like I was so blessed. I've done everything. You know, I traveled to countries. I spoke with politicians before and all of that. But I feel like I'm at this point, like I should be doing more, you know. Because, Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that you can have a huge influence uh, from that from that level of office. And and the thing is that the more good you do and the more you influence the more you want to influence, which is great. And that's why you have decided to, to take the jump. You won't regret it. And, you know, and I really wish you all the best of luck. Um, but don't give up because it could take a while to get there. Um, I didn't, I didn't get in the first time. Mm. I'm hoping you do, but just don't be dissuaded because it oh. is, it's it's a hike you know no, believe me like I that's you know something like a few people they know about me but if you really like if you know my life you would know nothing in my life was easy I never yeah. I was never lucky in my life everything I had to really work for even the Miss Iraq when I won Miss Iraq it was only because I won a previous competition and it was Miss Iraq you know, like I had to take the baby steps always you know I always feel that way I've rejected a million times you know deal with all of that like that's you know when people when they see you from the outside they think oh she must have is have it easy oh it must happen you know and it's not, it's not really not, you know, like people, they just don't know your personal, um, like struggle and hardships, you know? And Nothing worth it is ever easy. Yeah. I also exactly. think nobody's given me anything, you exactly. know, I've been yeah. put in the right positions and I'm, you know, I'm a believer. So I think God is always watching over me, but in terms of work, nobody's given me anything. Nobody. And so... Yeah, and you so don't you have need to, it. You're okay. a strong woman. I met you, you know, and like I was really impressed when I met you in Jerusalem. Like, honestly, are one of the like you are a rare combination. I will say this, you know, because you are very strong and like and you exhibit it and like and you are not afraid. But at the same time, you are very social. You know, like it's usually one of the two. I notice with a lot of women, they either have a strong personality, but they're like not. You know, they can't. What's the word? Like your social butterfly, you know, like you can be a social butterfly while maintaining your power. And that's something not many people, <laughs> you know, they can oh, do. I think, I think it's important. I think people lose sight of the fact that, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to be a representative of the people, it be uh, it's helpful if you like people. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I like people. <laughs> There's a lot of politicians that people for them is a burden to being in office and having power. I actually like people. And I think you do too, Sarah. So I think no, you're going to be no, no, Believe me, it's not about liking people. It's so I'm, I'm less like you when it comes to being extroverted. Like I think I'm shy. I'm, I hope exactly. I have shyness. I have worry. Like, oh my God, I'm gonna say something and they they will attack me or they will like I, I worry a lot about what people how they're gonna react, you know. Because it, it did happen to me before, you know, when I you got when I tried trauma. to let my guards down and people Well, you got down. trauma from what happened to you. It's normal. <laughs> but let me tell you, the higher you go and the more you work, mm -hmm. the less the, the just the thicker the skin that you grow. Mm -hmm. You know, you just yeah. grow thicker skin. And I, I remember when I started out in politics and people would write something nasty about me on Facebook. I'd be so upset. And now when they do, I'm like, bring it on, pal, bring it on. <laughs> no, I, you know what? I'm with you in that one. Like right now, sometimes it's even to the point where I laugh. You know, no, I just. I me too. 
I laugh and sometimes I, like I used to also get upset and raise awareness and say, oh, look what they're saying. This is a lie. And now I just read it and I just literally laugh. I'm like, really? Like yeah. um, it happened actually like a few weeks ago. I read this um, Arabic article. It was from a major news in the Middle East. And they were talking about the incident when I went to UCLA. I don't know if you saw it on Instagram. I saw it oh, okay. and I commented <laughs> on it. You were brave, lady. <laughs> Thank you. So, you know, basically what happened, like I literally I went there and, you know, they were like, no, she can't come in. I go on the sidewalk and they went to talk to the police and the police are like, she's fine. We can't do anything about her. Like she's standing here. And they would they kept sending like their security guards, like trying to intimidate me. I read the article and the article, Miss Iraq is arrested by the police <laughs> in Los Angeles. She went and she, um, what's the word like, اقتحام. hold on. I'm trying to find the word like, يقتحم. do you know Arabic or not? Captured. No, like when you, um, like, uh, what's the word? Like when people attack a place, I attack them. Stormed. 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 Sarah Adan stormed uh, the <laughs> Palestinian group. <laughs> you on your own with your high heels. <laughs> she stormed them and and she was intimidating them and then the uh, then they called the LAPD and the LAPD arrested her and she walked out humil humiliated and they like yeah they they took her to prison or I swear to God yeah yeah major good life sentence <laughs> I read it and I, I just laughed I didn't post it I didn't say anything but. I get you. I get you. Like you get to a point, like you build it. You just it has to because yeah. there are such horrible people. That, you know yeah. what we should do? We should do a mean tweet session because the stuff I've got, I can't even begin to tell you. But you just you develop yeah. a sense of humor. You 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 develop a thicker skin, and just you take things less personally. Um, you know, social media is a place where people feel free to abuse other people with zero. You know. Uh, with zero restrictions. And I think we have to take that in the measure that it's meant to be taken, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, not, I think yeah. You will, you, you're pretty tough. No, yeah, you are so right. Like it's easier to get angry and like lash out on people because they're not in front of you. They're and cowards. Think, you know, but they're cowards. Of, yeah, most of the time when I lash on people is because they already provoked me. I'll be honest with you, you know, like- of course. Like, yeah, the I also lash on people. I lash on people who are insulting to my people, to my country, unfair, mean, you yeah. know, bring it on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know what, by the way, I want to ask That's not my nature, but, you know, I'm, I'm a lion, so you're going to take me there. I'm going to fight. I love that. By the way, I wanted to ask you something since we're uh, talking about um, being provoked. And this is like literally the last time I was provoked on Twitter and I kind of just lost my shit. And I was literally cursing at people because they were cursing at me, you know, but um, it happened when Saudi Arabia, when they announced they were going to restore relations with Iran and they had, you Ooh. know, uh, China's so, president. So I wanted to ask you about that. Like, you know, I, this is basically how when people were yeah. being really disrespectful. But I wanted to ask you, like, this is such a turn of events that really, yeah. like, so many of us did not expect. You know, we were seeing, like, Abraham Accords, and we thought Israel is going to sign peace with Saudi Arabia. Do you know anything about that? Like, what is going on? Look, I think that, especially in a region like the Middle East, there was never a vacuum of power. And because America is not involved in the Middle East as much as some of us think they should be, mm -hmm. then the vacuum exists. And so China comes in. Uh, China's a country that uh, both is Saudi and Iran deal with. Mm -hmm. And they become these heroes brokering this peace. Mm -hmm. And um, and they've, they've created normalization ties. Now, I don't think this spells... Uh, the end of the potential of Saudi making peace with Israel. Uh, don't get me wrong. Um, I don't think all of a sudden they, they love each other. I think it's something practical uh, because of this vacuum of power um, that there is coming from the United States towards Saudi. I think the minute that the United States uh, you know, gets into the picture a little bit more, then 
you know, that that's, I, I think it's not going to be worth as much. But look, it's concerning for us in Israel because Iran is our sworn enemy who yeah. every Tuesday and Wednesday says that they want to obliterate us and destroy us. Um, and uh, but but Saudi, I I I don't think it spells the end of the Abraham Accords. Quite the contrary, and ultimately, I think that this is a, a this is a problem um, that America needs to help us solve. I don't know, but like, um, do you feel more like more threatened now? I mean, with this, I mean, when Saudi Arabia signs, you know, like when when they try to restore relations with Iran, like your enemy. Don't you feel like a little bit more insecure because, you know, they're both like, you know, huge countries and they're both very powerful countries? Yes, but you have to remember that they are they are fighting proxy battles mm -hmm. anyway, you know, in Yemen, mm -hmm. even the UAE, they were sending drones. It was crazy. So, like I said, it's not that all of a sudden they become best friends and they love each other. There's still a lot of animosity. They've created some type of uh, you know space to breathe, maybe to detente. So, so you're basically yeah. you're saying this is what's happening right now. This is not about restoring like peace or making peace with them or business with them. It's just about trying to put an end to the world they have in their proxies, like in Yemen. Like it's perhaps, better. perhaps it's a way of kind of taking a step back from their proxy wars that they're fighting. Um, but again, I, I really feel that this is a result of America stepping back uh, from the region because there's never a vacuum of power. Somebody's going to fill it. And this is what happened also, you know, with uh, with um, with Syria coming into uh, with Russia coming into Syria. Mm -hmm. This was the moment when America retreated from Syria yeah. and Russia just filled that gap. Uh, and now we have Russia in our northern border. So, again, there's never a vacuum of power. So when you pull back, somebody's going to fill that vacuum. And I'm hoping that, um, you know, that this Syria, uh, Iran, uh, that this UAE, um, uh, Saudi, Iran thing is not a bad thing for us. It might even be in a way a good thing for us. It kind of, they, they hold them back a little bit. Mm -hmm. At the moment, we're getting to very dangerous levels of, of enriched uranium. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, this is a genocidal regime that is killing its own people, murdering and raping its own women. Um, you know, this is a regime that everybody in the world should be extremely scared of um, and do everything in its power to uh, to to end this regime. Mm -hmm. Maybe the peace with, with Saudi or the normalization with Saudi will position the rest of us better. I'm not sure. I, I hope that it doesn't spell the end of the potential of the Israel-Saudi relationship. I don't, from the experts that I've spoken to, nobody fears that this is the end of that potential. Okay, let's hope so. Because that really scared me when I saw that. I'm like, yeah. what is happening? Like they're switching sides, China. I just, you know what? Maybe as an American, I feel even more threatened because it's China like breaking those yeah. deals, you know? So like- No, I, I understand I, that. China yeah. is is is- is you know is doing business with both of these players. Um, they need them for energy, um, and so you know this is not this doesn't just happen. This happens because again, when there's a vacuum, when there's already a pre-existing commercial relationship, this is what's going to happen. And so we just have to make sure that um, that we continue to do this under the radar, normalization, quietly, slowly. And and that and that is continuing to happen. I'm I'm happy to say. Okay, okay. That well, that's good to hear. <laughs> today know, um, we had a conference today, uh, like a peace and security conference for um, Abraham Accords in African countries here in Jerusalem. And there was a Saudi guy on the panel, and I had a, a good talk with him. Um, and again, you know, he says this is these are the things that Israel has to do. These are the things that Saudi has to do. He didn't think this was the end. And, you know, he came to Jerusalem to, to, to tell us. I was very encouraged by meeting him. He, you know, is a, a well-known journalist. And uh, and my under the, and my off-the-record conversations with him, I, I felt good that we could continue to be on a steady path with, for, with normalization. Hopefully. You know, that's the goal. Um, I wanted to ask you, so every 
everyone right now are watching the news, but we don't really like as much as we understand it. That, we are not really understanding. So can you please like try to explain like to the listeners, like people, you know, who live in the United States or other parts of the world, what is actually going on inside of Israel with the protests and yes, all of it's very confusing. And, you know, it's very interesting. And you know this, Sarah, better than anybody that Israel is a country that is a small country that somehow disproportionately always makes the news. Whatever goes on here is completely amplified um, everywhere in the world, much more than, you know, any country our size. Um, and so this is no exception. But I'll, I mean, I'll give you a little bit of background. Basically, the idea is that this government that won with a majority uh, decided to launch a process of judicial reforms. Mm -hmm. Now, why did we need judicial reforms? And I'm in favor of judi judicial reforms, because over the last 30 odd years, the judiciary has basically given itself, nobody's given the judiciary, no legislation, no, uh, no parliament, the judiciary has granted itself more and more power to the point that they are completely unchecked. In other words, any normal country is the judiciary. I mean, all branches of government need checks and balances. Are they like and our Supreme Court? They like are the judiciary, the, the ultimate uh, expression of the judiciary, the ultimate power of the judiciary is the Supreme Court. So okay. it's like your Supreme Court. In the United States, the Supreme Court is appointed by who? By the government. Here the Supreme Court has a judicial selection committee, which first of all is not transparent. Nobody knows what goes in there. And the power of veto lies in the hands of judges. So essentially what you have is a system mm -hmm. where judges are selecting other judges to join the Supreme Court. Now, what happens when a, when a group of people you know, are picking friends, their yeah, own friends, people. People who think like me. Yeah. Exactly. There's very little diversity. I see. And when you look at the makeup of the Supreme Court, you see very little diversity. Out of 15 Supreme Court justices, um, there's two Sephardi Jews. Mm -hmm. You know, we're 55% of the population and one Arab. Now, to me, that's not a diverse... How many Supreme people Court. are in there? 15. Out of 15 Supreme Court justices, there's two Sephardi Jews and one Arab. Now, in this country, we have 20% Arabs and almost 60% Sephardi Jews. <laughs> so how come the Supreme yeah. Court remains this kind of 1% elite that selects itself? That's one problem. The selection perpetuates a very homogeneous Supreme Court. There's little diversity, ethnic diversity, and there's very little political diversity. Everybody comes from the same club. And on top of that, the selection process is not transparent. So we don't know what the hell's going on in there. In America, you have, you know, uh, you have committees that are basically interrogating Nothing like that here. So that's one problem, which shows that the Supreme Court, in terms of the selection, is unchecked. The second problem, as I mentioned at the beginning, is that they that there was never in Israel a um, a kind of law to determine the scope of the power of the Supreme Court. Normally, a Supreme Court judges judicial review. In other words, is a law by parliament legal? Let's say we pass a law, we want to kill everybody with blue eyes, mm -hmm. right? It would go for judicial review, and then the judicial, the Supreme Court would say, no, no, you can't kill people with blue eyes because we have a human rights law that provides everybody um, protection and every people, whatever color eyes, are protected, right? Mm -hmm. That's what the Supreme Court normally judges. But in this country, the Supreme Court gave itself the power to get involved 
in administrative governmental decisions. For example, after 60 years of living as the only country in the Middle East with no natural resources, with no oil, Israel found gas. Mm -hmm. And it cost us billions of dollars of mm -hmm. waiting time because the Supreme Court took years to let us pull the gas from the ground. Now, what has that got to do with judicial review? Yeah. That is a purely yeah. governmental decision that we, the people, elect a government for the people, by the people, in order to make these decisions. We don't need the Supreme Court to come and say, hang on, I am the higher power here over your own prime minister, even though we're unelected people, because we've given ourselves this clause called the oh, reasonable. That is so flawed. I never, I never. Exactly. Nobody now. understands yeah. the need for judicial review. So what they're happened? Basically, they're trying to be more like the United States now. Exactly. We're trying now. People will okay. say, but you're not like the United States because you don't have a Bill of Rights. No, we don't have a Bill of Rights, but we have basic laws. Mm -hmm. And so there are similarities. There are differences. There are similarities with Canada, with the UK. But the one thing is very clear. This country is the only country in the democratic community of countries where the judiciary has so much what is called judicial activism. In mm -hmm. other words, we act almost as a second branch of government and say thank you because you don't have a, a second branch of government. And what would the people know? We know better than the people who elect these politicians. And so there's something inherently flawed by this system. So what this government tried to do, and because they had a majority, they could do it, was to uh, to undergo judicial reform, by which, A, the scope and power of the judiciary is defined. There you go. Here's a law. This defines your powers. And the second thing is that the government has a say, mm -hmm. which is more than a minority say. It's almost a majority say mm -hmm. in the selection of judges, which is what most countries have. Yeah. Those are the reforms. What happens, as so you know... Why, so why are the protests again? So what happened was okay. that the, 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 the opposition or the people that lost the election mm -hmm. use this... I, I mean, look, some people were genuinely worried, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who politicize this. Mm -hmm. And they said it's the end of democracy. This is it. From here to dictatorship. Why? On top of, instead of understanding that okay. this is a way of restoring democracies, restoring eroded checks and balances, that somehow they message this, that this was the end of democracy. So you had concerned people on the streets. You had a bitter opposition that lost the last election. Oh, you had the, okay. you yeah. have the people that hate Bibi. There's always the Bibi haters because he's been in power for a long time. And people just, they can't get rid of him in the, in the elections, so they need to get rid of him any other way. And so you had a, a combination of people with different interests mm. and in making the, the crowds very, very worried. They were, I'm telling you, I've got friends who are seriously worried. And then yeah, what made you Like one of my close friends, hello. You know, she's been protesting. I see her a lot. I know, I know. I, I love her. Well. So, yeah. I uh, so you have all this combination... But then, but then you have a government that the image of this government is not great because there are right-wing elements who sometimes open their mouths and they say outrageous things that are offensive. So you have a guy who's a homophobe and you have another guy who's a racist. Mm -hmm. And so the net result, and believe me, these are not people that I, that I agree with in any way, but the net result of that is the fear Look at this government. Look what they're trying to do. And look at the people who are going to be becoming dictators. So this whole kind of misinformation with some genuine concern. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna belittle the genuine concern mm -hmm. for some people who are definitely on the extreme side of the political spectrum. But the net result of all that is that people have been, you know have been really uh, concerned, manipulated in a way, and going out into the streets.
And so this has been happening for the last two months. And and uh, the, the prime minister spoke yeah. on national television tonight and said, you know what? I can see that people are very concerned. We need to make these reforms, but these reforms should not be pushed through. They should be deliberated and come up with some type of consensus formula. So the okay. prime minister has done the right thing, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, he believes in the unity of the people. And hopefully now we'll see a process in the next few months where we come to some type of compromise. So that's what's been going Okay, so now um, I think I saw the announcement like this morning, um, like before I talked to you, I saw like, yeah, he made an announcement. He said he will yeah. delay um, this act. But so what happens now? Like did the protests, did they die down or are they? Well, now we're, now we're going to see how genuine these protests were about the judicial okay. reform. This is what's interesting because I think that a little people were worried. Um, I think that a lot of people will calm down now from this, uh, the announcement of the prime minister, I mean, the, the stock exchange in Israel has already gone up. So there's kind of calm. There was supposed to be a general strike tomorrow. The general strike's being called off. So there is a little bit of like a breath here. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're going to see if the agitators really were worried about judicial reform or right. they were just using yeah. this as an excuse yeah. to try and bring down this government. And that we're going to be seeing over the next few weeks, what, what happens. And I genuinely hope that once the deliberation starts at the president's house, who is um, who has agreed and he's been, he's been the, trying to be the convener for a compromise, then everybody will calm down. Yeah. And most people were genuinely con concerned. And then there were a lot of people who were manipulating vulnerable, yeah. you know, people who felt vulnerable. No, honestly, I remember I saw people were protesting since the day he won. And, you know, like not one created exactly. coalition. Exactly. Mm -hmm. There were protests every Saturday night. Now, they weren't at the same scale, but mm -hmm. there are people who want him gone. Yeah. And, but the majority of the country still want him to be the prime minister. So you have to respect democracy. You have to respect the outcome of an election. That's true. Yeah. Like wh whoever is kind of like, you know, what happened here, like with Trump. Exactly. Like, you know, like exactly. Exactly. There's a bunch of people. Exactly. There's a bunch of people that are acting like the when Trump won, when people are like not my president. There's a bunch of people like that involved in these protests as well. And also it happened, you know, when Trump was voted out, stolen elections. Like, come yeah. on, just accept it. Accept it. It happened. Accept it. Exactly. Four more years. You can run again. Like, I don't understand those people. Like, just accept this is what the majority wanted. Exactly. You know? But then you have, like, I I feel like a lot of people, they start, like, uh, gripping on conspiracy theories that, you know what, the elections are not real. This is not real. And it's funny because those people, they usually, they will say that. And then the minute they win again, then. Well, exactly. They, they want democracy when they're winning, you know. <laughs> you know oh my god it's uh it's insane but i really hope things now will be better Me too. I, I pray we're going into you a period are... of festivals and then we've got our yeah. 75th anniversary of the state of israel it's supposed oh. to be a happy time but also tell me about uh what's going on with the council that you've created with emirates and i also oh. saw you brought people yeah. from african countries well this was the conference that we were at today i created two organizations one is called the UAE Israel Business Council. And today we have 7,000 businesses from the UAE and Israel, you know, on our platform. We, we do events. We put out um, articles. Um, we're kind of uh, thought leaders in the field and also conveners. And, and we have a very, very um, effective online platform. Mm -hmm. And then because I believe in female leadership, especially in the Middle East, I created the Gulf Israel Women's Forum. I co-founded that with my good friend, Justine Swirling. Mm -hmm. And that is basically female leaders from the Middle East, because I really think that if we're going to have a long-term sustainable peace, mm -hmm. then they should really let us women run the show, because we know how to build bridges very quickly. That. That's true. So, yes, yeah, so I've got Saudi women on my council, on my forum. I've got... Bahraini women, I've got Egyptian women who are like, oh, why didn't we ever have any of this when we made peace with Israel 40 years ago? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Jordanian women, Moroccan women. So all in all, and we do physical meetings. I'm very proud that the first ever 
physical meeting between Emiratis and Israelis. I mean, because we did the accords during the COVID. But the first ever physical meeting was my women's uh, uh, forum. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we built, uh, we're doing different programs. I'm running a program now for empowering women in high tech around the Middle East. I did a program here in Jerusalem for Jewish and Arab women. And now I'm going to extend it to the Middle East. So yeah. it's exciting. It's exciting. That's really nice. I, I There's always that. a lot to do. You you should be a, the a, the ambassador or like a foreign minister. Of the UA? <laughs> no, Maybe. You know, I would be. I would love that. To you, right? Like you, you, you have really, um, like your approach, you know how to approach people, you know how to talk to people, you know, and you know how to explain things well. And you have a really Thank nice, you, yeah. So I honestly, But I also think that because I come from a background where my mother comes from an Arab country, um, I feel that I I can speak the same language as in the Arab world, not Arabic, unfortunately. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, I understand the mentality. Yeah. I respect the mentality. I don't come. I think a lot of people uh, from Western countries come to the Middle East with this very high, um, high-handed attitude that, oh, I my values are better than your values. And, you know, and I always say, especially to young people who come to Israel and then are going to the UA, don't come with your set of values in judgment to them. You know, don't. It's a different place. They have a different tradition and culture. Come yeah. from a place of respect and understanding. Yeah. Some things you will agree, some things you don't. You don't have to get into every conversation. Um, but you can try and uh, and understand and build bridges. You don't have to come with your own set of values, judging their set of values. Yeah. And I think that not many people, not many modern women um, understand that. But because my mother comes from Morocco and I was raised with Muslims and Catholics in Gibraltar, you know, I can understand other cultures and other traditions. That's amazing. Well, it's you know what? I just hope, I don't know what you are up to, like in the future, what are your plans, but I hope you keep doing this. And I hope, you know, you'll be Israel representative, like with the Arabs in the Middle East, because you know how to communicate, you know? Thank you. When is your election? Sorry? When is your election? Uh, I haven't even filed yet. You know, I just announced it. I said, I'm interested and I'm talking to people right now. You know, That's next year? The election yeah, is next year. It's next year, but you you know, you need to start campaigning right yeah. now and you need to submit, I think, the paperwork before the end of the year. So um like all of this, like I need to start working on it right now. But um I'm just, you know, I'm like I'm testing the waters, I'm talking to people, see if uh if I get enough support, then I'm one hundred percent going in. But like these are my intentions right now to definitely run. Oh, good so for I, you. I wish you a lot of luck. It, you always have to raise a lot of money in these political yeah. campaigns, and that's yeah. tough. But I think you have enough and, credibility. And I never raised money before, so this will oh. be an experience. <laughs> but, you know, I think there will be enough people that believe in you to be able to donate to your campaign. Hopefully. You know, that's what I hope. Well, you anything know. I can do from Jerusalem. Oh, thank you. You are <laughs> so, sweet. so sweet. Thank you so much, Floor. It was amazing thank to you. have you and to actually explain everything, like, in details, you know, to the listeners and hopefully we'll have you again in the future. My pleasure. This is a great podcast. I've watched some of your episodes, so I'm really honored to be on it. Thank you so much. Love you. Love you.